Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for this uh, month's Sister Circle event, What's Our Worth? We are really excited to have this conversation today. It's a very timely um, conversation to have as we're, you know, coming out of, well, still in pandemic mode, but slowly getting, slowly but surely getting back into some in person programming, um, in person activities, but then also still, you know, involving conversations about the state of our communities today. Um, so we're very grateful to Ava for joining us today and having this conversation um, with us and with you all today. My name is Lucia Torres. I'm the executive director of Las Focos Project. And for those of you who are not familiar with the organization, I believe uh, most of you are who's joining us today. We are, are a photography mentoring organization inspiring teenage girls through photography. Uh, we use photography as a tool for our students to advocate for themselves, their communities, and also prepare themselves for a career in the creative industry. Um, we can get the next slide, please, Jesse. Thank you. And so today we have uh, this presentation brought to you by our sister circle. And so what our sister circle is, it is a network of supporters of the organization who invest in the organization in order for us to keep our programming running. It's a way for us to really build community outside of our classroom, uh, build community with our donor base, build community with you know uh, just everyone who is supporting the organization as a whole. And so as part of our Sister Circle membership program, we provide these monthly or bi-monthly uh, workshops and talks and dialogues for our sister circle members and the communities as well to come together and connect and be in community and really create a space that feels similar to the space that we create with our students during our programming uh, that they participate in. And so again, we're very uh, happy to have you all here today for this event and to engage in this very important dialogue uh, with our guest speaker. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in joining uh, the sister circle, Please let me know. Happy to support you and in, in being a part of this network. It's $25 a month to support the organization. And again, all of the proceeds go to supporting our photography program. Uh, but without further ado, I don't want to take too much more uh, of Ava's time. I want to welcome Ava Vieira Osmond, who is an arts educator and advocate and also a Las Fotos Project advisory board member. And I'll hand it off to you, Ava. All right. Hi guys, good evening. Just gonna get everything set up here. Awesome. So um, can everyone hear me okay? Good, okay. So um, today that I'm here and I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk to you all about a subject that I have been thinking a lot about for a long time now. Um, I've been working in the art space as an art worker for, I would say, um, oof, maybe over 10 years, I would say, maybe closer to 15. Um, and uh, it's an amazing, it's amazing world to be in. It's something that I'm incredibly uh, passionate about and care a lot about. Um, I want to continue that tradition of, um, of arts leadership and um, caring about the arts um, by doing the work that I do with lots of all those projects but um, it is still a area that has, it continues to grow um, and it continues to meet additional challenges, more and more challenges all the time. And there's a particular aspect that I really wanted to kind of bring to you all today at the Sister Circle and talk about as a community and share a little bit of my perspective, my experiences, and then have lots of opportunities for us to sort of take some of those ideas and use them as jumping off points for discussion. So just to kind of give you guys a lay of the land of how this is gonna work, my hope is that I'm gonna cover a couple of um, sort of ideas and then come upon some, what I would consider like critical questions or critical thoughts, like big questions, big thoughts. And then there'll be um, some time for discussion while that's still fresh in your mind. So I would encourage you all to turn on your video and your audio when the time comes for that discussion so that we can um, stop, pause for a little bit and do that. So uh, I'll go ahead and do the first, yeah, that's perfect, okay. So this is our first big, big idea or big question is this idea that um, I think summarizes some of the things that I'm going to talk about, which is that I wanna start with the challenges. There are um, obviously challenges to any 
uh, in the industry, um, certainly as from a perspective of a by POC of, as a woman, this is um, something that is no, I'm, I'm not unfamiliar with this. So one of the things that we need to acknowledge of the challenges is where we are starting from. What is our base point? And from my perspective, you know, we've definitely come a long way in the arts. Um, my perspective is mostly going to come from uh, being an art worker, sort of a visitor services, um, working with artists and museum perspective. But um, one of the things that we carry with us is this historical um, sort of baggage, if you will. And one of the things is that, you know, there are things that we just know to be true. Women, uh, female identifying by POC are more likely to accept lower paying positions than men. Uh, women, female identifying by POC tend to dominate high empathy connection based fields like education, uh, nursing, social work. So there is with with the um, with what we know about what it means to be a, a female identifying by POC in the workplace, we know that they're already carry, we already carry with us sort of a, a dominance in these fields. And, you know, an entry job in the arts for people that are interested in the arts um, is in some cases can be a decent beginning salary when you're starting off your career. Um, again, very much depends on what part of the industry you're in. But without opportunities for advancement, it's an unsupportable dead end. So the big idea that I kind of come to, my first big idea is we can teach you, we can care for you, and we can entertain you, but we cannot be in charge. And that leads into, I think, the next slide. We can move next. So um, there are two uh, Instagram accounts that I want you to immediately become very familiar with if you haven't already. One of them is called Cancel Art Galleries, which is, I'm not suggesting that, but uh, it's a great name. Um, and then the other one I'll show you, share with you in a minute. But um, these are two different anonymous Instagram accounts that people have set up for folks to send in their stories and their anonymous information about what it was like to work in these different art spaces. And I thought this one really spoke to some of what I'm talking about. So this is in all my years of doing HR for a gallery, my boss would salivate every time a man applied for a job. This would normally not pan out because these men would normally not accept the meager wages the gallery would offer. The difference in the way men negotiate pay in interviews reflects their privilege, the fact that they've never been criticized for being too ambitious or overreaching. So, uh, you know, these are generalities, but this is definitely something that I've personally experienced as someone who's been on the hiring side of working in the art space. Uh, you do kind of get this feeling like, where are all the men? And it's not because, you know, because, you know, it's, it's odd to work in a space as completely female dominated if it doesn't necessarily need to be. So uh, the question remains, so why is that the case? Is, and it's not just because men don't like art. There has to be something else going on. And over time, myself and a lot of other people, especially when you get closer to the hiring side of things, you realize that one of the biggest dividers is that just men will not accept, by and large, the low fees that we pay female or female identifying art workers. So um, that also sort of perpetuates some of the things I was talking about. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so one of the other things that I think is interesting to talk, is important to talk about is this idea of advancement within these institutions. So this is from the other uh, Instagram account called Change the Museum. So well, it's not called Cancel the Museum because even though I have my issues, I, I don't want that to happen. Um, and this, I, the, one of the things that I think is important to talk about also is that when we talk about advancement and there not being a space for advancement, we also need to talk about the fact that who gets advanced when there is advancement. And um, one of the things that, uh, that, that, this, that comes across on the Change the Museum page a lot, which I think this is something that a lot of us probably identify with, is as a, as a POC, the best decision I made for mental health is deciding to leave the art world. Even with over four years work experience and master's degree, pre-COVID, I was recommended internships. I'm not exactly sure, you know, basically saying, I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to make a living working with these internships and I can't wait around anymore. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, a lot of this comes from a, a historic, and I won't get into the history of it, but there is a historical perspective to this idea that 
the work that we do is free and the perspective comes not only from the public but also by our employers. And they demonstrate this by creating a division between white collar labor and blue collar uh, labor in the art space. So this goes into something that is on, I think the next slide. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so every head of museum education development, curatorial visitor experiences or publications department should really have direct experience doing the most junior level job at that department. So when I first started out in the art space, it was odd to me because I came in with actually a teaching credential and my, and my BA, but there was this expectation, well, if you're ever going to continue to move up, you can get job experience, that's great, but more importantly, you should get a master's degree in something. And that something depends on what part of the art space you're in. But uh, I did. And genuinely, and I, and I really think it was an amazing experience overall, but I genuinely look back on it and I think, why was that truly necessary? Or could I have spent that amount of time, like I did, working at the same time and achieved the same amount of, of, of knowledge? And did that basically buy me a ticket to the upper echelon of a museum system? And the answer is somewhat yes, somewhat no. Um, but the fact remains that a lot of the people that are higher up at a lot of these institutions don't have experience doing the lower level work. So there does seem to be this feeling like if you start off at a low level as a low level employee, how do you move up within arts organizations? What is, what is the litmus test? What is the ticket that you need? So next slide. So this is the big ideas, higher education, master's PhD is a class-based litmus test for entry into arts leadership. If you feel as though you could have achieved the same amount of learning without the uh, expense and time of higher education and could still be as effective of a leader, that to me, it seems at the end of the day that it is truly a class-based litmus test for entry into our leadership. And next slide. Um, so this is both a negative, but I also think kind of empowering in a, in a weird way. <laughs> Uh, maybe just because I'm a competitive person, but I, I did like this cancel art galleries post uh, one time when attempting to critique the power structures of the gallery, when, when, which placed women of color at the bottom while all senior executives were white. The white woman director interrupted me scoffing, but there will always be a power structure unless you want to run the gallery, which would be very hurtful to hear, but I think in hindsight or reading that is certainly made me think that that is the case. That, and that's why sort of I wanted to bring this conversation to this group today and to hear from all of you about your experiences and sort of your perspectives in this area, um, because there will always be the structure that we're in now unless we run the galleries, unless we run the show. Um, so next slide. So I wanted to open this up now to sort of a collective conversation while some of these ideas are fresh in our mind, or what are some challenges uh, by POC people that you have uh, faced by, by POC people that you have witnessed in the art space. But you know, I don't want to just hold us strictly to that. If there's anything that anyone wants to talk about related to any of the things that I was sort of speaking to earlier about the present landscape, um, I would love to hear it. So if anyone wants to turn their videos on, their mics on. Let's get into it. Nobody? Also, feel free to drop it in the chat if you have a, a thought. Yeah, if you have stuff going on in the background, fine with me. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, if anyone wants to share any perspectives that they have uh, that they'd like to share as somebody who's worked in an art space, any kind of art space, um, what are some of the challenges and that you think are in the present landscape that you um, that you want to talk about that any of this is bringing up for you? Um, thank you so much for being um, here today. Um, as a Filipino American who's a recent like undergraduate, I think a lot of my experience and just you know being in a university pursuing art, I've noticed that it's predominantly white women or white professors who only um, 
you know, can pursue this passion because, you know, by POC, we're sort of limited to what we can achieve, sort of, and it's sort of sometimes survival of the fittest where we can't achieve, you know, these higher education programs and get into teaching at that high level, especially in like the arts world where, you know, we're expected to be nurses or expected to be retail workers and all these essential jobs that won't be filled by, you know, our, the fellow professors and Caucasian, uh, I guess, higher ups. <laughs> um, and so I think that's also like a struggle that I've realized is my reality and trying to challenge that in my own pursuit and my like career as I get older and hoping to uplift everyone else with me like who feels like we can't like it's hard to achieve you know the higher positions in education. Yeah thank you so much yeah absolutely um and that brings me to one of the and I mean, that makes me think a little bit about one of the things that I first noticed when I started working in the art space is that um, when I first started working there and I worked at sort of the lower level, you know, quote unquote, of these institutions, I did look around and see a lot of faces that looked familiar to me and looked like a diverse group of people. Um, but one of the things that you're mentioning, is, and it's unfortunate that you're not seeing that in your classmates, but not unexpected, especially if it's, a, if it's an arts degree. Um, is that when you get, you look at, like you were mentioning, even leadership within your university, the leadership of your university is your professors from your perspective, and you're not seeing reflected back at you the faces of people who you identify with and find um, some commonality with. And that is, yeah, I mean, precisely the problem. And yeah, there is this feeling like, you know, it, yeah, so and I want to speak to also your, your point about um, up, uplifting and, and sort of amplifying certain voices of people that, um, that are like you that want that you want to see in these spaces. Uh, there is there is going to be at the end sort of a like, oh, what are we going to do about it part? So it's not all doom and gloom, I promise everybody. There are <laughs> some really great things that we're going to talk, talk about or some ideas we'll kick around. So anyone else have any other observations or thoughts that come to mind about this? Any questions? If anyone has just like a random question that they have about um, working in the art space or anything like that? Yeah, I did have something. Um, I'm, I'm from San Diego County and mm -hmm. I know that like where I'm from specifically, there aren't too many spaces run by people of color. I, mm -hmm. I know of one and I'm fortunate to be friends with this person who did start this space. Um, but some of my friends who are also like Chicanas and Latinas, they said that, you know, there's a lot of people in our neighborhoods who don't really know how to even get their foot in the door to even display their art in these types of spaces. And so, I just kind of started thinking how there's a lot of art and there's a lot of people who want to create, but they're just, they just don't really know how to go about it or how to get the connections. And um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to bring that up too, because I don't really have the like answers for that, but it's something that I'm starting to think about in my community. Yeah, those, so the two things that you sort of brought up for me is one is the idea of introducing art as a thing that everyone can do, um, sort of an art maker perspective. And then the other one is really bringing the art world to the people. Um, and those are two different things. I have more experience with the bringing the art world to the people part, but I will say that, there, I mean, there are maybe not in San Diego, but I also, I just feel like I always find that about new places that I would have said, they don't have that where I am, but they do somehow, uh, or they do and I can participate and help make it stronger. Um, but yeah, I, well, so to the part about introducing the idea of art to people, I mean, I think that the idea of letting people know that they are, that art spaces are for them uh, and that art is for them is a real hurdle to, to go, um, to get over in uh, the art world, especially with my POC folks, um, because I think there is this, there is a, 
a old and I think changing idea that art is not necessary, um, not particularly valuable, not lucrative, which is not, you know, it's not necessarily a misconception. So a lot of people just haven't spent a lot of time considering, um, you know, especially once they get to being an adult, how they can see themselves in art or how they can participate in art. And uh, the work of art workers, I think even in small and big ways, a lot of times is about teaching everybody, including adults, that they are, they have the ability to create, they have the ability to be creative in whatever way they see fit. And I think arguably right now, there is more of, people have more at their fingertips, abilities to be creative, with very little overhead cost. So things like we all carry cameras with us. So that one of the great things that I think is amazing about photography and why I wanted to be involved in Los Fotos is that photography is such an accessible art form right now because we all carry with us cameras. Whereas before, when I back day, when I took my photography class, I did it because my dad had a really old camera lying around, but he certainly wasn't gonna buy me a brand new camera so I could get a full photography class. Uh, or even things like TikTok, I mean, I keep, I keep seeing on Twitter people keep saying things like whoever the brand managers are for these different companies, the amount of talent that's out there that is under the age of 18, just watch these people because they're developing it in real time. The editing capabilities are amazing. From the perspective of bringing the museum, the art world to the people, there are also some really amazing organizations out there across the country that do um, some really incredible work with trying to break down the four walls of what we consider art spaces and really bring it into the community in a way that invites and creates access for the community. So there are some, some really incredible groups, but yes, to your point, um, these are very much being forged now, but I think the good news is that there are a lot of people working on some really exciting uh, ways to do that, that they're just work not that long ago at all. So there's some um, there's some great examples to sort of look to. I also, if there's still time, I wanted to yeah. just thank you for everything you've said because I complete, completely identify um, with what you've said. Um, I, yeah, immediately after getting my bachelor's, I worked in a couple arts institutions here in LA and I was kind of, yeah, the visitor services and bottom of the totem pole and had that idea of you know working hard and moving up and that just wasn't the case and you know seeing that disparity of like people on my level you know just kind of being a mirror image of me and then everyone at the top um just you know holding those positions uh they just did not look like me and they were more often than not uh white men and uh, working yeah at the Getty and then at the opera that kind of made me feel like I like really lessened my worth um, unfortunately and I think that's kind of led me to uh, I did eventually pursue or still am pursuing a master's degree um, but that kind of led me into that conversation that you kind of touched on on like you know people of color um, not really thinking that these are spaces for them and going about it in a different way and saying, you know, like in the Valley, there aren't really any museums, large cultural institutions, and why is that? And, you know, these um, neighborhood borders and social divides that are kind of reinforced by not really having access to these institutions. And so I think that's also a really important conversation to have. And, building and making these institutions more accessible and like not something you go to once a year um, on a field trip, maybe if your school has funding or access to that, um, that it shouldn't be relied on that. And I think maybe that in that way, it can encourage artists to feel more comfortable and have that access to displaying their art, but also, you know, opening up that conversation that it's not just for this elite class that we've always, you know, thought it belonged to, that everyone has that right to um, appreciate art and learn from different cultures and stories. And it doesn't belong to one group and more than one group can manage it. <laughs> 
which is what you said at the end made me think about this one of the interesting things about uh, one of the one of the topics that comes up a lot in museums right now or in the you know fairly recently is this idea of decolonizing museum spaces or decolonizing art spaces and one of the ideas really behind that if you I mean, not all the time, but if you want to unpack it, a lot of the time, certainly in a lot of these bigger institutions, is that the art world, in a sense, has always been for us because we created the art that's in these institutions that is no longer ours. But it wouldn't, this institution wouldn't be what it is if our art hadn't been taken from us and put there. So it's this, it's this weird thing that's like, well, if, if anyone is, is, um, has the ability or the perspective or the nuance to talk about this work and to engage deeply with this work and talk about these practices, it's uh, it's people from those cultures and taking that back and, and seeing those spaces and um, institutions become decolonized both in terms of, of what they have on display, but also in terms of the people that run them is also, um, is really interesting to watch, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's go. Oops, sorry. Uh, let's go into the slides again. We're going to talk about the current landscape, which is sort of what we were talking about before, but this is more in terms of sort of like what's happening right now. So, what's happening right now, <laughs> besides the pandemic, um, is that we are, but I think that's a big part of it. And we'll talk about that a little. I didn't touch on it a lot because it's very much happening right now, obviously. Um, but I would describe my big idea would be today's landscape is about small gains and growing pains. So I don't want to discount that there have been some really important shifts that have happened you know, more recently, like the idea that we even have um, people who work at museums versus people who are docents, which is how the museum world kind of got started. I mean, it, it's museums and galleries started essentially as curiosity cabinets that rich people had in their homes and he would go over to some rich person's house and they would show you all this weird stuff in their house and you'd be like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's basically what these places are today. So the big shift then came, you know, when they made it into big actual institutions was having people, generally upper class folks um, who had volunteer positions to talk to people and show them around these spaces. Um, moving it to an idea of actually um, employing people who can whose job is and their specialty is engaging with people and teaching them about the art and making sure in any way that those people are not just a completely homogenous group is still pretty new so those are all important things to, to keep in mind another small game that we'll talk about is the um how increasingly in uncommon it is for there to be unpaid internships uh, that's something that's actually illegal in some parts of the world, which I thought was really interesting. I didn't realize that until I was doing research. Um, but back in the day when I was first starting out in um, the working world, I made it like my job to, um, to find a paid internship, uh, which was very difficult then, but I did. Um, and I found a couple paid internships, but that was really, those were few and far between. So today, those are, I would say, the majority of art spaces have some kind of a paid internship program. It's not always easy to access for various reasons, but those are some small gains. But um, some of the growing pains that I want to talk about kind of come out of those small gains, because as we are, as we are growing, as this field is developing, there are new problems or new struggles that come up along with that. So let's move to the next slide. Um, so, for example, I found this interesting article that I obviously am not going to read the entirety of, but I want to just pull this part to show you guys. Uh, this was a study that was done with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in a partnership with AAM and Ithaca SNR. They did a um, study of the uh, 2015 to 2018, what, um, how much movement had happened in terms of um, equity and diversity and parity with regard to hiring practices. So the the so the title of the, of the article sounds really nice. It's like latest art museum staff demographic shows the number of African American curious women in leadership roles increase. Yes, but there's if you sort of read the fine prints a little bit more uh, nuanced than that. So I think that's on the next slide. 
So there's a lot, I, I definitely recommend that you guys go and find this because it is just really interesting to look at and I'm not going to read all these stats out, but it's pretty at a glance. You can definitely see some pretty big issues with the parity and inclusion and equity. Now it's getting better, just what I was sort of saying with small gains, but with that's going to come growing pains. Um, is it fair to, to title this uh, this article uh, about you know increase in African American leadership? Yeah, but I would I would probably give it a different title, something like things are getting slightly better or um, you know how we can move forward kind of a thing. Uh, you can still see that the intellectual leadership positions, which I thought was an interesting name for it, uh, for new hiring by uh, race and ethnicity is it's not great. Um, intellectual leadership positions by uh, what they do at the institution is also similarly not great. Um, although I do think it's interesting that uh, education is gonna be the highest, but uh, things like museum leadership is still, like the, the rest are kind of all at the same level. Uh, next slide. And then this is by gender, just um, in case folks were interested in that. Uh, you can definitely see that um, that women are do, do make up a large portion of these groups, um, uh, but you know it's still not at the level that I think we would want, or that the equity isn't there. Uh, next slide. So the other part of the landscape that I want to talk about are things that are related to how we move forward. So I don't know if folks here remember this was like for a museum nerd like me, huge news. Um, back before, in the before times for the pandemic, the Marciano Foundation. Uh, that was a big, gorgeous institution that opened. It, there was a lot of fanfare around that. They hired a ton of people, um, a lot of cool people. I was always very jealous of how cool everyone who worked there was. Uh, they had this great art. It was just, it was like the new sort of big wallet institution on the block in LA that had a ton of stuff to show. And uh, during, the, during the run of the Marciano Art Foundation, they had um, some of their staff members wanted to start a union, um, which is something that we'll also talk about. But unionization among art workers is, is something that I would count as how we move forward. And basically, once they, the Marciano Art Foundation kind of got a whiff that things were getting really serious, they just completely shut down the entire arts institution which is wild. That is not something that happens. Uh, no matter how bad things get, I, I don't think anyone thought that was gonna happen and then it did. Um, and so all these people were uh, laid off and they didn't have, um, and they didn't really have much of a recourse because they didn't actually have a union by that point. The other part of this that I think um, is worth talking about is this Google spreadsheet that was sent around in 2019 that was um, asking people to anonymously post their salaries. Uh, if you were an art worker, no matter where you worked, you didn't have to say where you worked or what part of the country you were in, um, you could share how much money you make and you could talk about your experience level and everything so that people could across the board see uh, what kind of uh, equity there or parity there was in these different jobs. And I think that was, those are those kinds of things are becoming more common than ever. And I think those are some important things to take into consideration with today's landscape. And I can move on to the next slide. So um, how do we move forward? So the sort of big ideas for this are solidarity, transparency, parity, and inclusion. Um, these are all things that I sort of touched on in the other uh, parts of the talk, but I'll uh, talk a little bit about how do we leverage these to move So let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is an article that was in Art Law, and it's about uh, an upward trend of unionizing in the museum industry. So I think some of us have heard that this has happened um, in different parts of the country, and there's a list down here of some of the museums, and they're not small institutions. These are large institutions with thousands of people that work there. Uh, that have successfully unionized over time. And um, the idea of unions for art workers is something that uh, is fairly new, but is certainly picking up steam. And this is all pre, well, a lot of the things I was aware of are pre-COVID. So one of the sort of big questions I wanna bring to the group when we have our discussion at the end 
is to talk about how do we predict, like in what ways do we think that COVID is going to affect um, the, these, this kind of momentum that's been building. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that I think is important also to think about how do we move forward, it's not just the big picture ideas that are kind of daunting and overwhelming to think about, but also like what are some things that we, we can easily or not so easily, but you know, with some effort do to make a change. Um, and here are some things that kind of came up for me as I was doing research and thinking about my experiences and what I'm seeing out there, um, mutual aid societies. So uh, some of us are familiar with mutual aid societies with this idea of not charity for charity's sake, but this idea of people within the community giving to other people in their communities. Uh, this actually came up and is related to the unionization. There's a an awesome museum I went to a long time ago, but it really stuck with me called the Tenement Museum in New York City. And it is a museum built within the walls of old tenement housing in uh, New York. And they had unionized their staff. And then because of COVID, they basically had to lay off almost entirely all of their staff, which is the majority of which were uh, visitor services and educators. So they, those folks, one of the things they were able to do after all of that was to create a mutual aid society and to support each other through that effort, which is a, which is I think a really powerful way of doing things. I've worked at other institutions where they had uh, policies similar to that that were started within their organization um, that I think are really, are, are, are un, underestimated or um, underappreciated maybe resource for folks. Supporting unionization efforts. Uh, mentorship and cohorts. So we were talking about this idea of not seeing yourself in leadership. We're not seeing yourself, uh, see, looking around and seeing uh, people you identify with who are at your sort of level of, in the hierarchy of wherever you work in the arts, but not seeing it necessarily um, movement at the top. Uh, as someone who's worked in these different kinds of spaces and spaces that felt both very diverse and, and some spaces that were shockingly non-diverse, um, I feel like I cannot, I cannot overestimate how important it is to find ways to mentor folks who are uh, newer to the organization or newer to the field than you in any kind of capacity and to create kind of affinity groups or cohorts within the people that you work with uh, to look for people that, you know, for whatever reason you feel like understand where you're coming from and understand your goals and uh, ideally people that are above you that will take the time to sit with you and just have a conversation. I've had, I've taken the chance to sort of grill people above me at other jobs before and, and I found incredibly um, useful information from them uh, if they were willing to talk and I'm always very, very um, happy to do the same um, and sort of pay it forward. Sharing wage information, that was something that I talked about um, that was in that Excel sheet. Those things are going around all the time. Um, I do think you can do it that way. I also think that if you feel comfortable, obviously, with it, sharing it you know, verbally with your colleagues, uh, especially if you know that someone is advocating for a raise or someone is you know, trying to figure out whether they should ask for a raise or things like that. Um, I think on multiple levels, it's kind of, I, I find it necessary to share that information if I feel like the person is open and willing and we have that kind of a relationship um, because it's the secrecy around it is only harming, is harming more people than it's helping. If possible, don't benefit from unpaid labor. So this is going to the unpaid internships part. Um, a call to action, a lot of these organizations that work on behalf of art workers have said is just, if possible, you know, from the inside, try to discourage your institution from uh, trying to find unpaid labor and try to always advocate for hiring people for positions when possible. And finally, you know, the hardest thing, but also like the simplest thing is promote from within. Uh, if you are someone who's in a position to hire or promote people, uh, you know, don't discount people who are from within your organization. They know your organization better than anybody else. Uh, they have, you've seen them in action, which is better than any interview you're going to have. And it's always important sometimes to, to hire from outside of an organization for various reasons. But so many times, and this goes to that uh, Instagram post I posted a, a while back that was about, you know, people not high up, not having experience at the lowest levels of an organization, uh, you can't really substitute for that. So if, it, if it's at all possible for um, us to take that knowledge with us as we move on in our careers, I think that's incredibly important. 
And then next slide, I think is, yeah, how else we move forward? So now we're gonna go back into chatting and that's it, that's the rest of it. We're just talking. So if anyone has anything they wanna say or thoughts or feelings or questions or anything about any of this stuff, like I wanna hear all of it now and I would love to talk about it. Thank you for all of that, Ava. As you were as you were sharing some of those thoughts about like how to move forward, uh, one of the thoughts that came to me too, and is especially around this idea of how do we uh, provide access to folks, right? How do we also create the sensation that the the art, the arts and the artist communities is for everyone to access? And it, it brought to mind. Um, the uh, arts collaborative group in, in East LA, ASCO, and how they just like completely bypass galleries altogether. And I love that. I'm a huge fan of just accessing public spaces and, and you know, activating areas that you wouldn't think would be activated as, you know, a public space. And I think one of the, before I was on staff at Las Fotos Project, uh, the organization did this really cool exhibition where uh, they cleaned up, or we cleaned up, because I was there cleaning up myself as a volunteer, <laughs> uh, cleaned up an alley in, in Royal Heights, and then hung all the, the photographs on the fence that was along the mm -hmm. alley, and then wheat pasted portraits that the students took of, I think it was the portraits of their moms that they took, um, just wheat pasted those on one of the concrete walls near the alley, and I thought that was like, that was one of, you know, just one of the reasons why I really fell in love with the organization at that time that I was volunteering, because it, it was just really great to see this, this public space activated. Um, and people were there because they knew that it was going to be a, a photography pop up. But then at the same time, you had people who are just walking down the street and saying, like, what is, what is, what is this? Yeah. What's going on? And then they walk down this, you know, newly cleaned up alleyway and are also at the same time being exposed to this photography from young, you know, young women in the community. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's another way, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of, of just activating public spaces and thinking about non traditional spaces to bring art into and to bring art conversations into as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it made me think about, you know, what is like, this sounds really big, but what is art? But one of the, one of the things that I think we like, why do we like art? Why do people like art? And like they actually like it. And I think one of the ideas is that it's, it's transformative. It takes you into a space. It, it sort of, like good, good art is transformative and transcendent and takes you into a space and you feel changed afterwards. And so you're saying, like, as you're talking about it, I've been to space, places where people have, you know, taken over and had, you know, public art or had a pop-up or things like that. And that it feels that much more impactful because it's sort of, the con it's taken out of context in a way and yet kept in context. It's, the context is the community and that makes it that much more powerful and um, transcendent for you as an audience member. And it almost seems silly to consider, you know, why would it be better to have this in a white box? Wouldn't it be better to have it in the community surrounded by uh, sights and sounds and people that represent and have it be an immersive experience? Um, that seems to also be just kind of where we're trending. And when you think about, if you want to look at it in like a marketing perspective, um, we're trending towards this idea, especially you know, generationally and just sort of where the, where the culture is at of wanting to be in the middle of our experiences and not wanting to see them from the outside. And I think that art is going to continue to follow that progression and, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to be a whole thing, but just something, something I mean, it sounds simple, but I know that there's a lot of work that goes into it, but um, these sorts of pop-ups are just, you know, they are they are excellent ways of doing that. And I think that they are in a lot of ways much better um, venues for those kinds of uh, exhibits. Yeah, and, and also just thinking about like coming back to this question of in a quote unquote post-pandemic world. Right? <laughs> yeah, like we're not like there yet, but you know. In the yeah. post-pandemic post world, you know, how we're going to come back into these art spaces. And, you know, you, you think about, it, I feel like people, you know, have conversations around like getting, getting back to normal, but, you know, I don't, 
I don't really think that it's ever going to be that way. I feel like there's there's always going to be a, a footprint of what's happening and what happened that last year and this is happening this year in how we move forward. Um, and so I think, you know, talking about this, like how do we move forward and how do we do that? I think that is also a, a, a way that we need to rethink about how we, you know, we have access to the arts and how we provide access to the arts because it'll be a while before we're going to have galleries up and running again, you know, and in, in, in their normal capacities. And so if that's the case, you know, it's liberate, liberate the art galleries, right? Put, <laughs> put it out there for everyone to, to access. Um, but you know what you're saying too, about the, in terms of, uh, you know, having artwork in this white box and it's just this idea of like, how do we then change that, that narrative that the, the artwork that happens in these community-based pop-ups is just as valid as the artwork that's hanging up in a multi-million billion dollar museum. You know, like mm -hmm. how do you change that dialogue and change that narrative that both pieces of art and, and both perspectives are equally as valuable, you know? Um, I think that's just like a, a question that I've been thinking about to myself and, and, it's, and especially, a, you know, kind of connecting it to the organization because that's always what I do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> is, you know, thinking about too as well. The, and I think that's one of the, the things that we always think about as an organization is making sure that the, the respect that we have for the artwork and the images that are created by our students is, is similar to like the respect that we would have for any artwork that's being created at any gallery because it's the perspectives are equally as, as valuable and the images are equally as valuable. And I think that's um, you know, one of the things that we always aim to do when we have these conversations too. Yeah, absolutely. I could definitely go on, but I wanted to know if anyone else had anything. Oh, Paula has some, some thoughts. Nice. Hi there, not just to be a weird <laughs> you know, person in a chat, but you know, in San Diego, I just wanted to put out this resource for, um, San Diego for photographers that there's that's their their niche but it's called medium photo they um they're growing they're uh, it's a group of photographers they do a lot of um uh, educational stuff both for like technical skills but also hearing from successful photographers like Kathy Opie and like these sort of big name artists um, they do portfolio reviews, they do all kinds of stuff, and it's a good way to meet um, people in the photo world. So awesome. check them out. And they, you know, they have a student membership. I don't know all the details of what they do, but um, so that's pretty affordable um, for the portfolio review. I know they charge, but I think that they would be um, open to doing a scholarship or a waiver if you ask for it. Nice. So. Awesome. Thank you. Sure, sure thing. Anyone else? People, by the oh. way, the organization, some of the, that organization is looking for you just like you're looking for them. Hmm. I, you know, so please don't be afraid to approach them. Like they want, they're like, where are we going to find these young people? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, really, <laughs> they are. So it's true. It's true. You know, it takes a little act of courage, but. What's the worst they can do? Tell you no? It's fine. No big deal. <laughs> so, there you go. There's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. And happy sure. You. Anyone else want to weigh in on something? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I just want to say, like recently, um, I've sort of started to become aware of like my passion for you know arts and the education and you know, it's like a natural thing for me. So why try to force any other journey, I guess, or path? Um, so I guess, I don't know if this is a selfish question, but if you could give advice to anyone starting out or, you know, wanting to take a gander at this and like pursue this crazy field. Um, I feel like there's so many opportunities and resources that we can reap of as young people in my generation. But I guess like, tangible like tips mm -hmm. and like solid advice from you yeah experience. 
I love giving advice, but uh, <laughs> well, but my favorite advice to give and what I'll give is the advice, like my favorite pieces of advice that I think have worn out to be true that I've heard from other people um, as I went through my career. Um, I think my first, the first best career, this is just general career advice that I got, I think when I was in college and I went to college, uh, my first, my BA was in journalism. Um, was basically someone was, I was like, how am I going to get a job? And I was like, well, be, be as much of a threat as you can. Like be a double threat, be a triple threat. Figure out what it is that someone who would want to hire you to do your dream job. Like what are all the skills that they would like you to have besides just the main one? So for example, I was like, well, I'm a writer. And they're like, well, do you take, do you take photos? Because these like newspapers and magazines and, and you know, websites or whatever, they, don't want to spend a ton of money on stuff. So if they can send you out to do your report in the field and you do the photos and you write it, you will get a lot more work than if you do just one. Or so that's sort of like a that's getting to know the industry that you want to work in, whether it's art or anything. It's just getting an idea of, you know, if I did this, but I also did this, I would be that much more of a great candidate for them to look at. Um, some other advice that I think is, and it, this goes to this idea of um, academic achievement as like a litmus test is, so I remember when I first started out in museums or working in art, um, I did sit someone down who was like the head of our department and was like, what should I do? Like, what am I going to do? Um, I'm like, do I, need a, do I need a master's degree? Do I need to, like, what, you know, what do I need to do? And she was, and she was like, honestly, and it, I think what her advice was, told me was that it's really up to the person who's hiring, which isn't always like the best because, you know, you never know who it's going to be. But what I thought was interesting, she said was from her, for her personally, she would much rather hire someone who didn't have an art history background. She said she had almost worked towards her art, her PhD in art history. And she said, the things that make me good at my job are not as because I had almost got a PhD in art history. The things that make me good at my job are all of the other pieces of experience and, and all the other aspects of who I am, all the other experiences that I've gotten along the way, that is what makes me an interesting and appealing candidate or good at my job. So thinking less about the, the, stand, the traditional ways of achievement, I think is also really important. I also think, even though we've talked a little bit about, you know, feeling like you're not represented in the upper echelons of groups, I, I still hold on to this idea that that sort of like immigrant work ethic or that sort of like say, yeah, my, so my grandma was big into just say that you can do anything. And then later, if you turns out you couldn't do it, just like, don't worry about it. No one's going to, no one's going to say anything. She would all, her best advice was always just say, yes, say I can, you can do it and like figure it out which it doesn't work all the time, but does work some of the time. So I like a big believer in that. I and mean, we kind of say yes to everything. Um, if you think that you can learn how to do it on the fly, uh, even if you say, I don't know how to do that, but I, I would really like to try and, and say like, I would like to do this thing. Like how, how do we, how can I work with you? My, my person who's asking me to do this thing um, to make it so that you can, so sort of like check my work. Like I want to try it and then I'll take something off of your plate, but I'd also really like to hear from you like how I could do it better. But always kind of keep saying yes to everything, um, especially, especially, or maybe only if you want to. Um, you know, things that you're a little bit scared to try out, but you'd like to try it. Um, investing in your relationships with people um, that you meet along the way that you think are cool, always kind of keep keep, hold on to the cool people. You never know where they're going to be or what they're going to, where they're going to work or who they're going to know and, uh, you know, how that could help you, or at least just kind of be there for you. There's, I think that's incredibly important. Um, yeah, I think those are my main ones. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. it feels so discouraging these days when there's this long list of qualifications for some internship or a job, <laughs> and it's like two to five years, and I just graduated, but I wanted to learn how to do this. I don't, but yeah, thank you so much for, <laughs> sure. for tips. Yeah, I mean, so I, that is true, and I and I kind of, I think people can lose sight of how, I mean, I 
I lose sight of it, but it was also feels like it wasn't that long ago that I was looking at something like, I have zero years of experience in this, but I feel like I could do it. Um, and I think that's really where it comes to, they say it's who you know. And I think they don't always mean who you know has to be someone fancy. It could just be someone who knows that you have common sense and you work hard and you have a creative eye and they'll hide, you know, keeping those people in your life and they'll hire you for something. Um, or you might know someone who knows somebody or those kinds of things. That's I've seen that happen many times. I've had that happen to me before where I on paper didn't really have any business getting that job, but I knew someone from my path who then was like, oh, I remember that you know how to spell and you can, and you like art and you do this and that and you're easy to work with and and that kind of will take you I'll take you far but um yeah just you know finding finding those spaces and those people that you feel like are going to be supportive and offer you some good opportunities and that you can support in kind is, is invaluable thank you <laughs> sure um, if I may um I just wanted to point out there have been studies about applying for jobs and that if men feel that they have 50 percent of the qualifications listed they'll apply and women if they don't have 99 percent of the qualifications they think i'll never get that job and they don't apply mm -hmm. so one of the key things is to apply mm -hmm. and it's hard it's hard to apply on linkedin or like for a cold ad like that those yeah. are they get a million resumes and all of that but apply and if you even if you get the interview go to the interview and have the conversation because that's experience and that's conversation mm -hmm. and if they say this isn't the right thing for you now but they'll know you and they'll remember you for another thing mm -hmm. so just put yourself out there and don't be afraid of that list because they'll put everything on that list that they they want you know michelle obama to be their <laughs> intern at whatever you know so put yourself out there the guys will do it yeah i remember when i first heard that study i was like dang it <laughs> so ever since that i've had in my head like take the like take the amount of qualifications that i need to have and like subtract four of those things and do i have like a, sort of trying to find a way to do the math in my head to encourage me to apply to some of these things over time has been like trying to sort of trick myself into doing that because it can be hard. Um, and if you've ever had the luxury or challenge of being on the other side of the table of trying to hire someone, um, that is also really helpful. I would I would love for, I don't know, it's impossible to do it in reverse, but I wish that everyone who was starting off applying for jobs also had the experience of hiring people for jobs because you will have had the experience of seeing someone on paper and you're like, I don't know. And then you meet them in person and like, no, they're perfect. Like, I know this is exactly what I want. And it doesn't matter that they didn't tick the boxes on two of those things because in your conversation with them, you realize that they were really amazing at these other things or they totally get where you're coming from or whatever it is. So that's very true, very, very true. Any other thoughts, folks? I think we're almost coming up on time, Yeah. Yeah, I was just I was just going to do a time check uh, at 8.03. So we don't want to keep folks too, too long. But if there are any other thoughts, we can. Um... Yeah, I mean, well, so in closing, I will just say that um, I love to talk about art and labor and <laughs> uh, museums and all that stuff. and inclusion and equity and everything. So if anyone wants to talk about it more, I'm always happy to chat uh, over email or I am on LinkedIn. I know LinkedIn is kind of funny, but like I will do stuff on LinkedIn sometimes. Um, and otherwise it's, it's basically where you can reach me, but um, I would love to continue the conversation. If anyone wants to just um, ask any questions offline, I'm happy to do that, um, offer any kind of support, finding certain resources. So, um, that's it. That's it for me. So thanks everybody for uh, sharing, for listening, for participating. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Eva, again, for, for joining us and for leading us in this conversation and everyone for your thoughts as well.
very, like you said, very important and timely conversation. I wish we could have like a, a much more extended conversation and evolve it into like, maybe we will, maybe we'll take the charge and evolve this into a larger sort of symposium, you know, conversation and get more people involved. Um, but it's also really great to be able to have like such, such an intimate uh, dialogue too. So th thank you all again for, for joining us. This has been recorded, so we'll send it out to everyone and also you know, share it with folks who haven't been able to join. So feel free to share this recording with others as well. Maybe um, hopefully it sparks some dialogue within you know, uh, your organizations and your communities also. Um, and don't forget to follow us on Instagram if you're not. I think you all are <laughs> already following us and connecting with us online. Um, and if you have any other questions about like our sister circle events, such as the one we had today, please feel free to email me. My email is there up on the screen. Um, or if you have any questions, or if you have any suggestions uh, actually for any future uh, sister circle events, or you yourself would like to moderate one, let me know. Uh, happy to have you all as a, as a guest moderator as well. Um, we're looking to really just, like I said, expand the conversations of you know, art education, art access, um, gender equity, racial justice, you know, anything and everything that connects with the work that our students are doing is what we're looking to have dialogues on. So please feel free to connect with me if you have any thoughts around that as well. More than welcome that too. Um, and yeah, folks, don't wanna keep you any longer. Really appreciate you all spending your Thursday night with us. And I hope you all have a really great and safe and relaxing weekend as well. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.